Hi everyone, it's Alex from Risk Academy and I'm here with Douglas Hubert um, who has just presented a session on his new upcoming book, the second version of his second book, The, the Failure of Risk Management. That's right. Um, I'm very grateful that you found the time to sit down with us. Um, well, what is this book going to be going to be about? Because I think when we when we spoke about it many 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 months ago, um, I asked you exactly that same question because I was saying that you published the first one in 2009, mm -hmm. and the reality is probably 95 percent of the risk managers out there haven't even implemented some of the most basic lessons that you've shared in the first book. Mm -hmm. So we're starting from a very low kind of baseline. Sure. Uh, right now, what are your plans for the next one? Well, we definitely know more about what some of the obstacles might be. Mm -hmm. Even if things haven't changed much, I think we've learned more about what the messaging could be. So the one of the things I'm adding to the book is the recent uh, survey we just wrapped up with KPMG Netherlands. Uh -huh. and so we did this in collaboration with them. And first, we find that only about one in five companies of a variety of sizes uh, in a variety of industries is using probabilistic models. And we're using that term kind of generously. Uh -huh. uh, so if they say they're using probabilistic quantitative models and they say they're doing Monte Carlo's, you know, statistical inferences from historical data, we say, okay, you're using quantitative methods. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest are using some version of qualitative methods. So high, medium, low, a risk matrix with, you know, yeah. one scale of one to five for likelihood and, yeah, and impact, yeah, yeah, yeah. et cetera. Uh, so uh, we knew that that would probably be the case, mm -hmm. right? Um, what's interesting is that now we've got even more research, not just the survey that we did, uh, but also others have published research about uh, what's in the way of that. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I did a lot of this research even writing the third edition of my first book and the last book, uh, How to Measure Anything in Cybersecurity That's Risk. Idea. In the course of that, I was coming across this other research, which I wanted to go back and say, okay, let's add that to mm -hmm. this. And then there, was, there were certainly other things I left out of the original edition that now I see are probably important enough to actually include. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do include uh, items in how to measure anything and how to measure anything in uh, cybersecurity risk that are actually applicable uh, in the management. failure of risk management book, yeah. and now I've decided to include those as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we find out that uh, uh, there is this thing called an algorithm aversion, mm -hmm. right? And so there are kind of ways of addressing the algorithm aversion, as mm -hmm. it turns out. There's, so there's a researcher, Deep Forst, um, who had... Uh, coin that term algorithm aversion. It's just a general tendency for people to uh, be more skeptical of algorithms, yeah. but also to penalize the algorithms more when there's a mistake on the algorithm. So uh, if a human estimator makes a mistake or an error, yeah. and they're using either of those two as a source mm -hmm. for something they have to estimate, and these yeah. in these controlled experiments, they were doing things like compensating people for estimating well, and you okay. can use either source. You have a human expert that yeah. you can rely on for some guidance, and you have an algorithm you could rely on for guidance. Yeah. And people might be estimating things like the GPA of a grad student based on their undergraduate performance or, yeah. you know, how much some property would sell for or something like yeah. this. And uh, So what this essentially means is that we as the decision makers have a much higher tolerance for human error than we do for algorithm error. Yeah. Even when it's revealed, the human is consistently worse than Wrong. the algorithm. Yeah. So what's interesting is there does appear to be a tendency to slightly prefer the algorithm at the beginning, yep. but they'll switch right over to the human on the first indication of errors yep. much yep. more quickly than the other way around. So, so we, we like trying new stuff, but then we almost immediately give up as, as soon as something doesn't go according to plan right? and go back to something that is significantly worse. Right. Which is fascinating. And the people who do start out with the human, when the human starts making errors, it's much harder for them to switch to the algorithm. Mm. Uh, so you do observe traffic both directions, but it's much different between, depending on which direction you're going. So we've observed that. Uh, we've gathered more data about, you know, what the sources of resistance are. Mm -hmm. um, people uh, still believe that it's too complicated. Yeah. Um, and I think they're imagining... Uh, you know, potential very complicated models that don't necessarily have to be the models that they first start with. There, there are, 
you know, steps along the way. There are many increments mm -hmm. that they could adapt. Um, when uh, we did this for a large uh, utility, uh -huh. uh, when we were doing this analysis and we were recommending uh, additional quantitative methods, the only benchmark they really had for probabilistic methods for risk assessment is what they were doing in nuclear power, which is much more sophisticated, granular, yeah. sophisticated, advanced. Um, so that's what they thought we were talking about uh, mm -hmm. if we say you should do more quantitative methods. But of course, you can do something far short of that and still outperform expert intuition. That's mm -hmm. the key point. Mm -hmm. As we tell people, the most important decision is how you make decisions. And your biggest risk is how you measure risk. Yep. Those are the meta decision and the meta risk problems. So we have to step back a level and ask, how do we know the relative performance mm -hmm. of different methods? And there are choices to make there. Uh, and we don't have to default to uh, just unaided experience uh, if there's any problem with a quantitative model. Both of those models, and they're both models, yep. so human experts are running a model, even mm -hmm. if it's between their ears and no one else gets to see it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, flipping a coin would be a model, etc. Uh, so the question is, between those two models, what does research say about their relative performance? Mm -hmm. And there's been a ton of research. Yep. Uh, so, And some of that is available since mm -hmm. I wrote the first mm -hmm. edition of that. So um, uh, there's a lot more to write, um, so I'm still trying to get the manuscript out the door. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, we're going to be pulling over some content that I ended up developing subsequently for other editions of other books that mm -hmm. I in now I see are much more relevant yeah. even for this book. So um, uh, that's what we're doing. One of the f fascinating, I mean, because we, we have a lot of conversations about that, and every time it's exactly the same conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I've used the qualitative tools. Uh, better and the only difference in performance is because you apparently don't understand how to use the qualitative tools and right. there's some sort of magical way to better use right. those qualitative tools. Well, that's not what's, what the empirical research supports. Apparently, there's been done a lot of studies. Yes, that show that it's become a bit true. of a, you know, a go-to response yeah. to say if somebody has a criticism of a, if we talk, it's not just a criticism of risk matrices, but we show data and research about the uh, rel the errors that are added by it, somebody yep. can quickly respond. We see this uh, many times that, yep. well, it, it depends on how you're using it. Exactly. Well, no, they all of the people in the research were using it and using it in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the case that only the people who were using it correctly weren't having these problems. Yep. Yep. Uh, that was not what was observed. So it's kind of begging the question a bit. Uh, and, and some of the research even shows that the um, the errors are fundamental to the design of the tool. So there's no matter how you use it, there's literally nothing you can do to kind of overcome this in right. built. Then the only question in that case is, are those errors worse than the errors that you would get from a quantitative model? And the answer is, yes, those errors are worse than what you would get in a quantitative model. So it's always a relative performance of models. Mm -hmm. It's never about which model is perfect. Of course, neither one is. The question is only, which model is less wrong? Mm. So the first thing they have to do is recognize that no matter how they're doing it, they're using a model. Yep. Uh, not only does that model have a measurable performance, but there's a pretty good chance, and it's almost certain, that it's been measured. Mm -hmm. And lots of aspects of it have been measured. Yep. So now the only question is, which model measurably outperforms the yep. other? Which one's less wrong? Yep. And the, the other most common excuse, and this one is a bit more difficult to deal with because it's you know, part of our reality, is that that's what the regulators are asking for. That's what the, some of the legislation says. That's what some of the standards are implying or explicitly stating. Uh -huh. And you, you've done the, the checking and you verified that that's actually unfortunately sometimes true. Yes, that's right. So there is a, a definitely you know inertia in the system because there are built-in standards and regulatory requirements that are still there regardless of when the research comes out. You know, No matter how convincing the research might be, someone's still asking for this stuff. And so another thing that we're adding uh, on this edition of the book is some new information about uh, uh, regulatory requirements and, you know, quote unquote, best practices that are described in standards. Uh, that adds inertia to the whole process. People can't turn on a dime because of all of that stuff. So to a certain degree, we have to try to inform those sources, the, the, the regulators. We have to inform the yep. standards organizations and get them to change. Yep. Actually, I noticed something did change a little bit. So one of the NIST standards used to explicitly define a risk matrix, and now it doesn't specify a risk matrix. It still has ordinal scales, mm. but the risk matrix part of 
appears to be gone now. Maybe there's something seeping so, through so, there. So, some progress there. Yeah. And, and the same progress is happening in some of the ISO standards where it used to explicitly ask for a matrix or a register, you know, right. something along the line, and it doesn't anymore, which is you know, a, a, positive, right. a, a positive change. That might yeah. not be sufficient at, yeah. because it appears that uh, given the choices, a lot of people will simply interpret that as continued use of a qualitative model. So if you say, if you tell somebody you have to do a risk assessment, like like uh, Sarbanes Oxley does, and like Dodd Frank and things like this, they're telling people to do risk assessments. If they don't specify it, um, they In end up interpreting minds, them as the qualitative. Yeah, risk yeah. assessment is generating a risk report. Which and, is and, supposedly in the case outcome. of Dodd Frank, for example, actually yeah. that one does specify a risk matrix even. Mm, mm. So for for the FDIC, yeah. for the Federal Deposit so, Insurance. So as, as an advice for all our listeners, and I think you had it very well summarized in one of your slides today, is be pragmatic about everything, uh, and yeah, being pragmatic, especially about best practices in risk management. Mm -hmm. I mean, risk management is such a weird space because essentially what we're using is we're using, using decision science, we're using probability theory, using maybe you know something from behavioral economics. All of those kind of fields are very important. And then somehow we have this whole you know, channel of risk information with risk best practices, which doesn't actually correspond to any of those underlying sciences. Yeah. It started out in a different, it's, it's a bit of a historical accident, mm. you know, so uh, s momentum started building in certain areas back in the, you know, 80s, um, and it appears that uh, some of the original ideas for this came from sort of audit uh, within organizations, yeah. and that was very quickly picked up on by, you know, the, the big five, actually the big eight, uh, when I started there, is when it was starting to get some exposure. Um, and uh, it's a pretty simple approach. So I've, I've no doubt it was developed in parallel in more place than, places than once. But there is a, there might be a kind of a patient zero, though, for this. So um, it's a bit of a historical accident. And then, of course, once you get past a tipping point and enough people are using stuff, things like this, then it ends up in regulations and standards and Nobody stuff really like that. Nobody really questions it. Yeah, and then it becomes harder to unwind it. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, so what's one advice would you give to our listeners um, if they're thinking of starting a career in risk or they've been in risk for, for a while and they want to kind of reinvigorate their, yeah. their life. Yeah, other than read my books, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> which, is so, a, which is kind of a given. Yeah, I mean. okay, yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, yeah I, I'm not going to disagree. Uh, so uh, uh, I think uh, the best thing to do is just ask the question constantly in the beginning and throughout your career, how do we know what works? Just ask what that question even means and how you would observe that sort of thing. And then start looking for the research because there's a good chance somebody's measured at least aspects of that question. Uh, and as long as you keep that level of skepticism, how do I know what works throughout your whole career, um, I think you'll be moving the whole industry as well as your career in the right direction. Yeah, and, and I think this is, this is very well said. And when you begin to unravel that, the, the almost immediate kind of conclusion is whatever the risk manager is doing, is that actually leading to better decision making? Yeah. And most of the time, the, the whole castle starts falling apart because you're doing the risk analysis for the sake of risk analysis, and then you report it as a risk analysis. Right. But then all those decisions are being made by executives somewhere in a separate room at a separate time frame, right. w w which is weird. That's right. Well, when we think about the history of it, though, um, it looks like, again, I, I'm kind of zeroing in on the patient zero here, but it looks like you know, it was originally an audit which means compliance uh, mm. exercise. And so I can see why it kind of became the way it is yeah. when it started out that way, um, as opposed to optimizing decisions or just improving decisions measurably in some way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for thank your time, you. Alex.